see something, you'll see a delay there. So this will be the line up. Tapes go fly. Switch over to the other tab. All right. So same thing. You're gonna have a delay here, so don't get too focused on that. Okay. Should be good to go. So we should be good to go, Steve. Um, and you'll see the image over here, and just move the finger or something where I can. I guess I can move over here. I'll get out of the way. You're on. Okay. Hi, I'm Steve Gibson. We're here at Orlando Outfitters, and we're going to do a seminar tonight on beach snook fishing. Um, it's something that, that I like to do. It's my favorite time of year. I'm from the Sarasota area, and uh, basically, I fish all up and down the coast on the west coast of Florida. Can we go ahead and get the next, next slide here? Okay, and go ahead and advance it. All right, when do we do this? Usually it's April through September. It can go into October, it can even go into to November, but basically it's when the water temperature hits 75 degrees. And once it stays warm, the fish will be out there. Last year we fished uh, the snook along the beach uh, through October. Uh, the peak, I think, is July through August. What they're doing out there, it's all part of their spawning situation. The, the snook will leave the bay, spread out along the beach, and they, they spawn during that time of year. Uh, they'll stay out there until about the first, first cold front of the fall. When, that, when you get a significant cold front, then they'll move back into the bays. Okay? Go ahead and get to the next slide. Where I fish, I'm located in Sarasota, which is 70 or about 45 minutes south of Tampa. So I'm fishing from Anna Maria Island all the way down to Marco Island. Uh, I've put in a lot of uh, time over the years. I'd hate to think of how many um, miles I've walked on the beach, but it's a lot. Uh, so I've found that some beaches are better than others. You'll, you can find snook in the surf most anywhere, but my favorite spots include Casey Key, which is at Venice, Manasota Key, which is just south of there, Longboat Key, and then down to Gasparilla Island. Yeah, you, you went backwards. Let's go forward a little bit. Uh, four, okay, four. One more. There we go. And like I say, I'm fishing the the west coast. Uh, you can you can beach snook uh, fish along the east coast of Florida, but my home water is the west coast. Okay, time. Uh, I get a lot of a lot of heat out of this. In fact, uh, I'm a retired outdoor writer. I spent 35 years with the Herald Tribune in Sarasota, and uh, a competing outdoor writer uh, once responded in print after I wrote an article on beach snook fishing. I tell people you don't have to be out there until 7 30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And of course his his reply was is any any saltwater fisherman uh, worth anything knows that to catch the snook you got to be out there before daylight. The only problem is is when you're sight fishing you can't see the fish if you don't have sufficient light. So what it is is that the sun gets up uh, it's coming up behind you out of the east and it lights the water up. You get out there at 7.30 in the morning, your window visibility is maybe, maybe 10 feet. But by 10 o'clock in the morning, you can see uh, 100 feet or more. Uh, I usually fish until about 1 in the afternoon. And the reason is, is that uh, the afternoon sea breeze comes up, and which roughs up the surf, and also now the sun is in your eyes. Uh, so uh, I, I'm out there roughly 7.30. To, to one and uh, you know there are always exceptions to every rule you can you can sometimes the fish are hitting so much you can catch them at four o'clock in the afternoon but but we're like to sight sight fish so the important thing is is you got enough light to be able to see the fish all right the tide that's always one of the critical questions what tide do you like to fish well you know what one of the things that I hate is is you plan a fishing trip you're going to go on Friday, you spend all week preparing, and the night, bef night before, you're all excited, you had trouble sleep sleeping the night before, you get up and you go, oh, I can't go, the tide's wrong. No, I go out there and whatever the tide is doing when I go, that's, that's the one I'm fishing. But if I had to pick, if things were perfect in a perfect world, I'd take an incoming tide. But you've got to figure, you've got four tides a day, you know, three, three weeks out of the month. So you're going you're gonna to have an incoming tide sometime during the day. What is funny is that I've gotten down to the beach before, and people have said to me, uh, well, you might as well go home. They're not hitting. Well, I found 
that sooner or later those fish are going to start hitting. And the same fish that you've been casting at that have been ignoring everything that you're throwing will eventually turn on and they'll start hitting. And you'll catch six or seven fish in 45 minutes. Go ahead. And, there we go. One more. You're going on the floor. There we go. Equipment. It's not real. Uh, we, we catch a lot of big snook out there, but it's not real critical that you use use a, a big rod because there's absolutely nothing to get in trouble with. There's no docks. There's 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 nothing. It's, you just got a wide open. In fact, the the biggest snook I ever caught on the beach was about 22 pounds. I got it on a six weight. Uh, just let them run, do their thing, and eventually you can get them in. And, and really, the fight's not too long. Because I'm not an advocate of using too light of equipment and, and killing the fish, you know, exhausting the fish. But I would generally recommend a six to nine weight rod, uh, floating line, or as my, as my PowerPoint says, a floating ling, floating line with a clear intermediate sink tip, uh, 10 to 15 pound leader with a 20 to 25 fluorocarbon shock, shock tippet. Uh, stripping baskets are optional. A lot of people like them, some don't. I, I, for one, don't really like a stripping basket, but if, you, if you're used to it, then it's fine. Uh, other equipment, cap or hat, flats boots, sunscreen, water, uh, pliers, nippers, extra leader material, coarse flies, a fanny pack, a check pack, or a backpack, uh, or sh shoulder bag. Uh, Going back to the, the, the flats boots, a lot of people will want to wear sandals or tennis shoes out there. It's the worst thing you can wear. You're going to get sand and shell in them. You're, it's going to hurt your feet. I wear flats boots and preferably flats boots without zippers, uh, neoprene slip-ons, because sooner or later the sand or the shell will get in the zippers and just render them useless. And you'll have to take a pair of pliers and it'll rip the pull off and you need to go buy a new pair. You can go through these pretty quick. You, you know, you've got your sunscreen. This is all the stuff that, that I use out there. Most important thing is your sunglasses. And um, back in my writing days, I, I, I called up one of the uh, uh, presidents of one of the nationally known sunglass companies, and we talked about quality sunglasses. I always advise getting the most, uh, getting the best sunglasses that you can afford. And he explained polarization to me, why you should have quality sunglasses, and I said, that's all well and good, but how can you convince someone to go out and spend $250 on a pair of sunglasses? He goes, that's really easy. He says, if you think of it, sunglasses are nothing more than fishing equipment that are going to improve your fishing, going to improve your catch. People don't think of anything and go out, go, going out and spend a couple hundred dollars on a spinning rod or $500 on a fly rod or however much, but they want to cheap out on the sunglasses. It's really, it's essential since we're sight fishing for these snook, you've got to be able to cut through the glare and to see the fish. And with a quality pair of sunglasses, uh, you can do that. Where to look? Well, this was my opening slide and uh, I included it in here again because you can see they're really close to the beach on our side on the west coast. Uh, there's, I, I think I've tried to count this several times, I think there's 22 snook in that photo and most of them are just three or four feet from, from the dry sand. Um, I call the area from the dry sand out, out to about five or six feet, I call that the feeding zone. When the fish are there, they're usually cruising, they're going to be cruising north to south or south to north and they're in there looking for food. Uh, their food is going to be uh, pilchards, glass minnows, uh, sand fleas, uh, crabs, whatever they can find, but they're usually actively feeding when they're cruising in that zone. And, and you can see here that those fish are um, all lined up and this happens to be they're all hidden south. And we'll, we'll normally find fish, we'll find singles, doubles, and as the season goes on you'll find, find, uh, find large schools of fish out there. When you find schools they're normally fairly easy, if it ever gets easy. But the schools, you got the competition factor, and they're not going to let their buddy get the meal. They're going to they're going to get it quick. A lot of times, though, when you get fish, especially if you get a school that's been fished, or um, maybe the leader of the the, the school is uh, is spooked, you can get in front of them, cast out, and let the first few fish swim past, and then start retrieving your fly and you can a lot of times get fish that way. Um, where, where to look for these fish we're talking about. 
Well, that's a shadow. That's a, that's a big Australian pine on the beach and casting a shadow. Believe it or not, that structure, at least to the fish, for some reason they think that that dark water uh, made by the shadow, that that, that is uh, structure and that means safety. And I've sometimes walked up on a shadow and seen a hundred snook in there. It's tough to see in because you don't have much light, but if you look closely and you can cut through the glare and look on the bottom, you can, uh, you can see fish. So I check out every shadow. And not every shadow will have fish, but uh, a lot of times they, they will. And you can sometimes uh, sit there and cast into that shadow and catch several fish before the, before the bite ends. That happens to be uh, the top of an old rock uh, or groin uh, that was on the beach. Uh, and you can see the snook hanging around there. Snook are structure oriented by nature and they're gonna hang around anything like that. And you can see them there, there's a, there's a snook on all sides of that. And uh, anytime you get into a structure like that, it's always worth a cast. Uh, sometimes they'll hit real good, sometimes they're real aggressive. Other times they won't hit at all. Now what, we've, what we usually find when we're looking for snook is we're looking for the cruisers, the ones that are uh, three to five feet off the dry sand and, and moving, actively moving. They'll, they're the ones that are gonna be most aggressive. When you get fish that are out in what we call the, uh, the, 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 the trench, the gully, uh, the trough, a lot of times they'll be lying on the bottom and they'll be facing west. Those fish aren't active and they uh, sometimes will not hit anything. They're always worth a try and especially on slow days. You never know. Uh, you know, there's no nevers and there's no always. Uh, so it's always worth a try there. Uh, the thing about this photo is the guy is showing you where not to stand when you're out there. Stand on the dry sand because, believe it or not, right at his feet is enough water for a snook to move through. And even if there's one out just a little further, he's going to spook them. But that's how close to the beach they are. And just another photo of, you know, there's sometimes there's tremendous amount of fish out there. Uh, the years vary. It, it's it's like anything else. There, you'll have two or three great years in a row. Uh, you'll have some down years, and uh, the, the the numbers vary. Uh, last year was so-so, uh, but on a typical trip, uh, I'll put many of my clients on four to six hundred snook of the morning. Uh, so you know, there there are just times when there are more snook than others. Now. Just because we put you on a lot of snook doesn't mean you're going to catch them. I mean, they're they're still they're still tough to catch out there. And you can see uh, this is a, a client of mine from Miami. He came over and got a pretty decent sized school of fish out in front of him. And and sometimes you have to lower your silhouette and get down and kneel. Uh, uh, sometimes just you're you're out there and just the act of raising the rod to cast is enough to spook them. Uh, you can judge that as you go. If you're into spooky fish, lower your profile, take a knee, uh, what, whatever it takes. Other days, you can, you can slap a, a fly down uh, on the water as hard as you can, hit them in the head, and, and five or six fish will rush it and, and eat it. You know, they're very aggressive. So you just got to figure out the fish. And I always tell people, uh, no matter what type of fishing you do it, let the, let the fish tell you what's going on, you know, and what flies they want to hit. And you find one that works, well, keep, you know, keep using it. Uh, this is another good way to find fish, is that the, the fish are revealing themselves there. They're driving, that's the predominant bait out there. Those are pilchards, scaled sardines, and uh, the snook are just blowing them up. I have walked down the beach, and, and, and this happened last year too, where, where they will drive those minnows up onto the dry sand, and you'll walk by and there's a hundred, hundred uh, uh, pilchards on the dry sand that have been driven out of the water by snook because they don't want to get eaten. The cast, I think this is the most important thing. And, and one of the neat things about it is, is that because the fish are so close to the beach, you, you don't have to make really long casts. Um, it, it, it's not important at all. What's important is that you are accurate with your cast and that you put the fly in the right place. The fish that we're uh, looking for mainly are the active fish that are cruising parallel to the beach, very close, and you, you've got to determine which direction is the fish moving. 
if you're walking north on the beach and, and you see a, a fish coming towards you that's swimming south, all you got to do is stay right where you're at. And as the fish approaches, I like I advise people to cast straight out. That's a perpendicular cast, straight out. And what you want to do is time your retrieve so that the fly and the fish meet at the same place at the same time. Then one of two things are going to happen is that the fish is either going to ignore your offering or it's going to turn to follow your fly. And when it does that, you've got to trigger a strike. And you can trigger a spike a strike many, many times by just simply speeding up your retrieve and make the fish think that it's getting away. At this point, a lot of times, uh, if you, especially if you're using a floating fly line, the fly line is inside the rod tip, which is not good if you've got a big snook after you fish because you hook the fish and he's going to either break the leader or rip a guide off of your, or rip the tip off your fly rod. So what I do at that point a lot of times is I just glide the fly just by lifting the rod and keeping the, the fly line outside the rod tip. The fly. This is, this is the DT variation. It's a very simple fly. Um, it, the original one was sent to me by a guide uh, down in Naples, Florida, Matt Hoover, and uh, he told me, and this was 30 years ago, he told me, he says, this is the only fly you'll ever need on the beach. And you know what? 30 years later, he's right. It's the only fly I use out there. Now, I have experimented with a lot of different flies, and I keep going back to this, and it's pretty much my, my fly of choice. It's an easy fly to tie, and uh, my idea of a good fly is, is a fly that can be tied, that's easy to tie, can be tied in five steps or less, five minutes or less, and most importantly, that the fish will hit it. And they do, they hit this a lot. All the fly is, is an old stew app tarpon fly. Stew app tarpon fly is usually tied in orange and yellow, but that's all this is. The original DT Special uh, didn't have eyes, didn't have a, a UV uh, coated head, and the entire shank of the hook was covered in thread. But it, it, all it is is uh, uh, four hackles as a tail and a palmered collar. Uh, I add the eyes and boom, you're done. You know, put the UV coating on it and, and you're done. It's very easy, uh, very quick to tie, and it catches fish. And it's got a lot of fish over the years. I call it the DT variation. I don't take credit for the fly. All I did was tweak it a little. And uh, it's just a, a, a variation of the DT special. Um, the bait out on the beach is predominant. These are glass minnows. Uh, is, is glass minnows, and you saw in that other photo, uh, uh, pilchards or scaled sardines, or they're also called white bait on the west coast. And that's predominantly your bait. You'll get some finger mullet out there for time to time. And I've caught snook out. I've caught snook out there that have uh, have had have eaten crabs. Uh, but I think that you're going to be better off using a minnow bait fish imitation than you are a crab fly. There's a lot of other fish that are out there in the surf that are available to you too. Uh, this is a, a glass minnow imitation that I tie. It's another one uh, that's, that's, that's very easy. It's got a marabou tail. It's got a super hair back. Uh, the, the body is built up with uh, uh, body braid and then it's uh, add the eyes, a little flash, and then coat it with UV. And it, it works pretty well out there too. Uh, any fly will work, and, and it just depends on who you talk to. Um, people will say, well, use this fly, we'll use that fly. Um, I know what works for me, and it's worked well over the years, but I just, I tell people, you know, experiment and figure out what works for you. The, the, the deal with the, the, the white flies are, it's the easiest fly to see when you cast it out in that water in front of the fish. And it's very important that you can see the fly and see where it is in relationship to the fish. If you're fishing a fly that you can't see, you don't know if that fish is tracking your fly or not. But if you can see your fly, see where the fish is, you, you know how the fish is reacting to it. And it, and it really uh, works very well for me. And, and you can see there about the size of the, 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 size of the fly and, and the bait that's out there. Just another different type of fly there. Go, go back to that other one. Just another, another type of fly. And I, I found that even with that little bit of uh, uh, olive on top, it, it makes the fly that much tougher to see. I don't know why, but, but it does. And uh, that's why I favor the all white fly. Uh, you can see that fly, that, that, excuse me, that fly, that snook was just, had its nose right against the beach. And uh, um, 
I, I was shooting that with a long lens. I wasn't really on top of the fish like you might think, but I was shooting that with a long lens, and uh, um, I, I think the guy that was with me actually caught that fish. It was pretty nice. I think he's coming up here. Yeah, there it was. And um, but that's a, you know that's a pretty nice snook. Uh, we don't ever fish for snook out there. First of all, the season's closed that time of year. Uh, that's when they spawn, so they are protected. And over on the west coast right now, snook are just, they've been shut down for almost a, a year or more now, and they're still closed. And, and I don't know when the moratorium's going to be lifted, but I don't keep them anyway. I had someone call me up the other day and was interested in a charter, and, and uh, he, he asked, well, what kind of fish are we going to catch and what can I take home? I said, none. <laughs> you know, what do you mean none? <laughs> I said, look, I said, my prices are really reasonable, and what you save going with me, uh, we weren't, he wasn't interested in big snook fishing, but going out in the kayaks, I said, well, what you save going out with me, man, you can take your wife to the best seafood restaurant in town. You know, I just, to me, I, I don't have any problem with people going out and, and, and uh, uh, staying within the law and keeping a trout or whatever if they want to eat it, but for me as a guide who makes my living out on the water, to go out and kill fish, that's like a that's like a candy store operator, candy store owner eating lollipops. It just doesn't make any sense. And uh, the size of the fish that we get out there, your 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 average size fish is going to be 22, 21, 22 inches, uh, and those are the males. Uh, snook do a sexual transformation at about 27 inches. Uh, they're all born males, and and the bigger snook that you see. Uh, they've all transformed into females. It's a rather unique uh, phenomena. But so there's a lot of males out there that are that are courting these females, and uh, and you'll find them. But there are some really really big fish. Uh, on a typical trip, uh, we might see 12 or 14, uh, 20 to 30 pound snook. Uh, they're they're really extremely tough. Um, I tell people that especially when we're getting into a situation where we're getting into a lot of uh, big snook, is that you've got to be as focused and in tune with what's going on uh, with the 12th, 15th big snook as you are in the first, because 99 times out of 100 they won't hit, but eventually they will. And <laughs> I've seen I've seen people really get buck fever out there. I had, a, I had another rider out one time, and. Uh, we had, he, he wanted to do an article on beach snook, and I said, sure, I'll help you out. So we met at, 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 uh, at in the morning, and we drove down to a, a, a different beach uh, further south from Sarasota, and it was just too rough. The waves were crashing on the beach, which ruined your, your visibility. It stirs up the sand and, and makes things really tough, and I said, well, I said, let's let's drive north. We can go up to up to Venice, and I, I think he said, well, if it's rough here, it's going to be rough there. I said, no, not necessarily. The beach geography is a little bit different. Just the angle of the beach is different. We got up there, and it was really quite fishable, and he did pretty good. He's a good good fly angler. He did pretty good. I think he landed five five small snook, and we're walking along, and I saw this this big snook, probably twenty five or so pounds. And I said, uh, I said, look. There's a big snook there. I said, I want you to put a fly about five foot to the left. He says, that's not a snook. I go, what do you mean? He says, that's a, that's a, that's a patch of grass. I said, well, do me a favor. I said, cast about five foot to the left of that patch of grass. And he did. And I think he made a great cast because he didn't think it was a snook. He thought it was a patch of grass and he was going to appease me. And he, he made a nice cast. He put it out there. I said, let it sink. And then I said, now strip it just a little bit, strip it again. And the patch of grass levitated off the bottom and inhaled the, uh, the fly. And he did everything right. He strip struck the, the fish and he drove the hook in a couple times and the fish took off, but he forgot to, left, forgot to let go with his left hand. And of course you heard the firecracker of the, of the leader breaking. And uh, when that happened, he looked at me, he says, don't say a word. I know what I did. <laughs> that's buck fever, and that's what will happen. But the, the, the point is is that you've got to be as in tune on the, on the 10th or 15th big snook as you are in the first because as soon as you let your guard down, that's when, that's when they hit. This was funny. This is a guy from our fly club, and uh, uh, I think he's 80 years old. 
uh, he, we went down there, and he says, I was down with the fly club last week, beat snook fishing. I said, oh, yeah, how'd you do? He said, I didn't see a snook. I said, really? He said, and so we went out there, and he hooked 14 that day and landed 11, 11 of them. And basically what it is is that, and I think this is true for any, any time you go fishing, is the, the, the biggest secret is to fish where there are fish. Because if you fish where there are fish, you got a chance of catching them. But if you fish where there aren't any fish, you, you don't have a chance at all. And uh, it's just a matter of getting out there and knowing what you're looking for, uh, knowing where to look, uh, 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 making sure your eyes can cut through that glare. I think Lefty Cray wrote about it in one of his books. And it's like if you're, if you're downtown New York City and you're walking past all the stores and the big windows, and the windows, you can, you can stop and you can comb your hair and your, and your reflection in that window. You've got to look beyond your reflection to see what's behind the glass. Same thing out here on the beach. You've got to look, uh, cut through the glare and look on the bottom for the fish. And then you've got to determine what is a fish. And I tell everybody, if you go out there looking for a whole fish with with eyes, scales, tails, fins, you'll probably miss a lot of these fish. What you're looking for is shape, you're looking for color, you're looking for movement. And a lot of these fish, you'll notice the ones that you've seen have all been real bright. They, they're chameleon-like. They can change to fit the, to adapt to their environment. And a lot of them will come out and uh, uh, if, if you're looking for that whole fish, you'll never see one. You've, you've got to be able to uh, uh, figure out what's a snook and what isn't. Uh, there, you know, you'll run out to you'll find grass patches, you'll find rocks, and uh, uh, believe me, a lot of grass patches and rocks have had have had a lot of flies cast to them. That one's a little dark. That was a that was a nice little snook. I think that was down on uh, that's on Manasota Key, I, I believe. But that was a nice little fit. And that's the first snook that guy ever caught in his life, so he was pretty happy. Um, ge beach geography is really important and, and beach ge geography can change from day to day, week to week, month to month, and year to year. And this was after a big storm and you can see the water uh, behind the, the, the beach there. Um, it, it, it changes all the time. And I found too that whatever beach was hot last year doesn't necessarily mean that beach is going to be hot this year. You just got to put in the time and, and hit your spots and determine. Uh, like uh, two years ago uh, on the West Coast, we had severe red tide. And two of my favorite spots were just shut down by red tide. So I had to fish north. And I ended up doing pretty well on the northern end of Longboat Key, which is not an area that I, I, I fish a lot. But it was the only place there were fish because fish aren't going to be where there's red tide. And uh, it, they, it did have fish, but like last year, I never fished up there one time. Uh, fish were back in their, their normal spots. Um, just another typical fish out there. Uh, nothing, nothing special, but the action can be pretty fast sometimes. This was, uh, yeah, that's a, you can keep on going. Keep on. Uh, problems that you'll encounter. Uh, wind, we talked about red tide, red drift algae, which is a, a, a seaweed type of thing, uh, grass off the bottom. Uh, when it's cloudy, you can't see the fish. Uh, the fish will be out there and you can catch them, but you can't see them. So it, 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 um, it results in blind casting. And, and the whole attraction of it out there is that, it's, that it is sight fishing. And rough seas will also uh, uh, cause a problem. It churns the water up and that reduces your visibility. So you, you got a whole myriad of problems. Uh, one thing that I use is uh, uh, I use WindFinder uh, app on my phone to let me know what I want is either very light wind or if it's going to be, um, you know, wind up in 10, 15, 18 miles an hour. If it's out of the east, that's okay because it knocks the seas down and you can still fish. If it's out of the southwest or west or north, uh, northwest, forget it. But uh, so I use that to make a prediction. Also, if you'll hunt around on the internet, you can find a lot of places have beach cameras. And I've found uh, some beach cameras for uh, the areas that I like to fish. And you just take a look at it and you can say, yep, things are great. I can go fishing today. And it saves you, it saves you a drive a lot of times. Um, 
You can see the storms coming. That's a nice shelf cloud coming in there. But uh, uh, you, you can, that, that can uh, curtail your fishing. When you get clouds like that, it, it puts so much glare on the water that you really can't see fish. When you've got very few clouds and the sun is out at, at, from 10 o'clock in the morning on, you can, you can see a fish 110, 120 feet away. Uh, but when, the, when it's like that with those clouds, you, your window of visibility might be five foot at best. You really can't hardly see anything at all. <clears throat> and of course, when it's, uh, when it's too windy, this was Hurricane Michael two years ago. Uh, as it was passing way out in the Gulf, it's time for the surfers. Well, obviously, when you have big seas like that and strong winds, uh, you can surf, but you, you really would have a hard time sight fishing. Um, a lot of people will go, I, I go home, that's red tide. That's not red tide right there. What that is, and that's not a problem so much, that's fresh water. That is, the, the Venice Inlet is just a mile south of where I'm at, and that's fresh water that's coming out into the Gulf. We get a lot of rain in the summer, and uh, it's coming out into the Gulf through the pass and spreads out. And it's not red tide, and you can catch fish in that stuff. It's just that root beer tannin stained water is all that is, and it's not red tide. Because if it was red tide, uh, there'd be some dead fish around. That is red drift algae, that uh, patch, that you see, the dark patch you see out in the beach there, and you can see some of it washed up on, on, the, uh, on the sand there. That can be a real problem. Uh, I'll show you on the next slide why. Um, it, it gets real bad, and the fish don't like to swim in it because it gets in their gills, so they'll stay, they'll stay offshore and won't come in and, and be around it. It's called red drift algae, whatever you want to call it, but it's not good and, and the fish don't like it. Okay, another problem is fly line around your feet. And it always happens whenever, they're, whenever you hook a big fish or whenever you're cast into a big fish. It's very common, very annoying, and uh, go to the next slide, you'll see what happens. There it is, it's gonna tangle right around your feet. And like I said, it's the most inopportune time. But there's an easy, a very easy way to eliminate the problem, and that simply is when we advance to the next slide, it's just step back, get on the dry sand. A lot of people want to get close. You don't have to get close. The fish aren't very far away. Just step back, get out of the water, and uh, you eliminate that problem. Uh, those are some rock groins uh, that, that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's funny, on this set, this is on Casey Key, and... Uh, uh, just north of, of the Venice Inlet, and you would think that, you know, every one of them would have fish on it, but it doesn't happen there. The northernmost one always has fish on it, and maybe the second one will have fish on it, and the, re the rest don't, uh, most of the time, but you can always count on them around that, that most northern one. And from my, from where I uh, start, like, you need a, you need a, an access to get to the beach, uh, if you, if you know someone that owns a home on the beach, that's great, you know, where you can park and just walk through their yard to get on the beach. But I have to go uh, through a public access. I park at Nokomis Public Beach and walk north. And you can see up there to the north where the land comes around. From Nokomis Public Beach up to that point is three miles. So that's a, that's a six-mile trek. Uh, and, you know, it's a good workout. So if anything, you know, you can tell the wife, you know, I'm going to go do some cardio today. Because you're going to put in, if you're going to catch fish, you're going to put in some mileage. It'd be nice if you walked out there and, you know, as soon as you hit the beach, the fish were there and you never had to move all day, but it doesn't really work like that. Another typical fish that, that we get, well, that's a, that's a pretty fish right there. And other species that we get, you get a little bit of everything. I, I, I mean, we, we've caught a little bit of everything out there. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a pompano. Uh, uh, we, we catch them from time to time. Uh, we had a guy in our club the other day, and he was out, out uh, fly fishing the surf, and he was out there because he heard the pompano were running. Well, I, I've, been, I've been doing taking people out on the beach for 35 years, and we've caught three pompano in 35 years. So, yeah, you can catch them, but the bad news is you don't catch them very often. Uh, they're really tough to see out there, and they're, they're really not quite common. I catch a lot of pompano on fly rod, but most of them come from Sarasota Bay or Tampa Bay. Uh, we get into sea trout out there, and if you catch sea trout, if you find them, it's normally first thing in the spring. It's usually April, maybe into early May, and there's some, a lot of times they're, 
They're not any monsters uh, usually, but they're all solid two, three, four pounders. Although I, I've had some casts at some six and seven pounders. I've never caught one that big out there, but I've caught some three and four pounders. And they're very, very aggressive. Uh, if you see a trout out there, you're normally gonna you're normally gonna catch it. Or at least at least you'll 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 have a chance to hook it. Tarpon, um, I've hooked. Well, I'll go back to the best day I ever had uh, beach snook fishing was in, remember in 2010, we had record cold temperatures that year, which actually the, the, the fisheries biologists say it killed, or estimated it killed 10% of the snook on Florida's west coast. Well, that was the best summer for beach snook fishing I ever had. And on that particular day, it was in August of 2010, uh, it wasn't great in terms of numbers, but in terms of size, I caught 15 snook. Uh, eight of them were 28 inches or larger. The biggest one was, was 42 inches, which was the 22 pounder I told you about. I caught and released three oversized red and I jumped 300 pound tarpon on that day. Now, let's go back just a little bit, not the slide. Let's go back earlier in the presentation, I was telling you about the tide. And the, the tide's roughly gonna vary about 45 minutes per day. So. I had the best day ever that I ever had on the beach, and I went down the next day. Tides 45 minutes later. I didn't see any redfish. I didn't see any tarpon, and I caught two little 18-inch snook. So what what was the difference in 24 hours? I I don't know. I I I have no clue what it was. I just know that the fish weren't there. One day they were there. They were feeding. I saw three tarpon and jumped three tarpon. Now what are you going to do with a with a 110-pound tarpon? on a six weight fly rod standing on the beach. You let them jump a few times, you hold your spool, pop them off so you don't want to lose your fly line, break your leader. Uh, redfish, we, we got a, this summer was really good on redfish. Uh, typically, they're gonna be a late season thing. This was in September. Um, you know, your, your redfish uh, school up in August and September and they leave the bays and they go out into the Gulf. It's all associated with the, the, the spawning uh, uh, ritual. And those redfish never go back into the bays. They leave and they never come back. Well, you can encounter them on the beach quite often. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, and I, I got into them several times and we caught a lot of redfish on the beach this summer. And that's Captain Rick Grasset. He's uh, been in business over in Sarasota for a long, long time. We've been friends for, for 30 years. We do a lot of fishing together. and. Uh, I finally talked him into going out on the beach with me again, and I, I think we caught 10 redfish that day, and, and some snook, and, and had a really good time, and that was a typical redfish that we get out there. Uh, Jack Crevel, um, that was early spring. That was a year ago in March. Uh, this fellow was a, a, a guide, a trout guide from Wyoming, and he got a hold of me, and I said, well, it's a little bit early, uh, I said, occasionally we get into, into snook out there this time of year. And we got out on the beach that day, and it was just, you just had a sense that it was going to go on. There was a lot of bait, uh, and, and he, he caught a little bit of everything that day. But I remember saying to him, I said, I said, this is the kind of day where we get the schools of big Jack Craval that come in. And that's, that's fairly large for us. Uh, typically in the bays, the jacks will be a pound, two pounds. And uh, that, that's a decent fish. And Two minutes after I said that, here came a school of jacks just blowing up on the water, and he got a fly. I think he hooked two or three before he finally stuck this one for good, and he, and he landed it. And uh, he was impressed with the fight, because jacks can fight pretty well. And same trip, triple tail. Now, I don't know how many people get triple tail uh, in the surf. Well, uh, not very common where we're at. Triple tail on the west coast of Florida is, or is mainly a fall and winter game and you go out and you fish the uh, styrofoam uh, crab trap markers, the floats. And normally you'll find the, the, the triple tail up against the floats or on the line down to the, the trap. And that's normally how they are, are uh, uh, found. Well, last year, and I don't know why, I've never seen them like this before, I may never see them again, we got into triple tail for about six weeks every trip. Uh, you, you'd get get there and and when I first saw them I didn't know what they were uh, I, I just thought it was a, a wad of grass but it was on the surface and they were moving and and I you know 
dawned on me, hey, I've seen this before, they were triple tail. And we were averaging four or five, uh, landing four or five triple tail per, per trip, all about that, that size, but it was, it was really neat. And I, I want to tell you that, that uh, this production will be on YouTube, and I've got a lot of videos on YouTube. I've got videos of the, of the triple tail, but I've got a lot of beach snook fishing uh, videos. And just go Steve Gibson, type in Steve Gibson beach snook, or Steve Gibson, I do a lot of peacock bass fishing down around Naples. Uh, you can do Steve Gibson peacock bass, and I, I don't know, I have 30 videos on there now, which is which is pretty neat. But if, if you want to look at them, so you can go ahead and advance those. <coughs> Mangrove snapper, uh, we, we get into a little, little bit of everything. Flounder, and I think what's neat about that photo is how that fish just blends right into the bottom. And you know, what they'll do is they just bury up into the bottom and they can camouflage themselves. And they're opportunistic, they're just waiting for something to swim by and when it does, they'll They'll just reach up and grab it. And that was a that was a, a, a nice flounder that uh, you don't catch very many flounder on fly, but when you do, they're usually pretty nice ones. A houndfish. Uh, it's a it's a it's a needlefish on steroids. These fish will get three three and a half feet long. Uh, they're thick. They've got big bodies, and and if you they're hard to hook because you can see that beak is pretty small, and it's hard to get a get a. a, a sink a hook into but they will hit a fly and when they do hit a fly they do marlin marlin like jumps it was it was uh, uh, funny I had never seen one out in the surf before and I was fishing with a guy down in Boca Grande by the name of Chris Mitchell and he told me he says oh yeah if you walk the surf in August he says you'll see, you'll see triple tail I mean see a, a hound fish and uh, we were we were out in the August after that and and sure enough they, they were out there but I've seen them even outside of August. And they're they're pretty neat fish if you can if you can sink the hook in one. And you'll see the next one. They they can be pretty mean. They're pretty mean looking, but they get pretty big. Yeah, you know, like I say, they're a needle fish on steroids. Uh, sharks. That's a big old tiger shark. I was I was fighting a snook at the time, and here this thing came down the beach, and I'm going, oh whoa! And he he actually wasn't even interested in in my fish, but. But that, that's a pretty big, I don't know if the picture does it justice, that's a pretty big fish right there. Uh, and we encounter shar sharks out there from time to time. They're not, I wouldn't say that you're gonna see them daily, but you'll, you'll see them from time to time. What was interesting was I was fishing one day and I had a snook on. In one second, it was me and my snook. In a fraction of a second, my snook was gone. A big, uh, I, I think it was a bull shark came in and just inhaled and ate my fish whole. And so I had to re-rig, and I turned around, I, I, I tied a new fly on, I turned around, I'm walking up the beach, two minutes later I ran into this, this gentleman whose two, two daughters were, you know, three and five years old, they're out in the water, and I, I said, I don't want to alarm you, I said, but I just, I just encountered a, a fairly large bull shark. And I said, so you might want to watch your daughters. <laughs> and he goes, he looks up and he goes, why, I don't see a shark. And I said, well, that's the thing. You're not going to see them until it's too late. Fortunately, the shark didn't come back around. But, but you know, they are opportunistic, and they can, they can strike. They've got amazing speed. I caught that one on a, on a, on a five weight. I was, I was out there, and that's a friend of mine who was out tarpon fishing out there, uh, Captain Ed Hurst. And he, he actually saw me catch it. He came in, and he took some photos of me. So... But I took this one by myself. That was a nice snook on a, on a, on a five weight. Like I said, there's nothing to get in trouble with, so you can just let them run. And it's not too rough on these fish. They, they all swim off pretty, pretty well. Um, just another, another bunch of snook. Uh, when you get them in that situation, like I said, they're, they're normally not going to hit, uh, uh, but, but, but they will from time to time. And, and if, if I haven't got any aggressive moving fish, then I'll sit there and cast it. What I'll do a lot of times is, is that, how do you, it's how do you present the fly uh, to these these fish? And it's like if you cast a fly over them, the fly line's going to spook the fish. So what we use is what's called a, a, a curl cast, which is basically a sidearm cast using the uh, the rod to whip around and curl your line in front of it, so that you're not casting the line over the fish. And it's an effective cast, and you can you can. Uh, cast a fish like that without spooking them. 
And that's me, Southern Draw Kayak Fishing. I've been guiding full time, uh, geez, I can't believe it, all, uh, what, 16 years now. And I uh, can't believe it's this long. I can't believe how much fishing I've done. But, but it's, a, it's a fun way to fish. Uh, I don't use any kayaks in the summer when I beach foot snook fishing, of course. Uh, in fact, uh, once June gets here, I put the kayaks in the garage and they normally don't even come out of the, out of the garage until, until the beach snook fishing done. And I, I had a really good year last year in terms of business. Uh, I love doing it. It's my favorite way to fish. Uh, it's interesting how I, how I started doing this was uh, back in the 80s. We were out tarpon fishing, uh, a friend and I, in his boat, and his battery went dead, and he couldn't start his engine. And we're drifting in towards the shore, and he throws out an anchor, and he gets out and wades to shore, and he's going to, I don't know if he went up and, knocked on the door and used the phone or how he did it, but he, called, he was able to call someone to, to come in and, uh, and, and bring a battery. Well, this probably took an hour. In the meantime, I got out and started walking and I'm seeing all these snook in the surf. And you know, the, the, the proverbial light bulb lit. And I thought, wow, these things will, uh, they're worth a possibility. And I've been doing it ever since about 1987. And I, I found that they, they, you know, the, the action can be fast, it can be fun. Uh, you can catch a lot of fish. It's a good way to catch a fish on fly. It's sight fishing, which is my favorite way to fish. If, if, I, had my, if I had my druthers, if life was perfect, I, I, I love bone fishing. That's my favorite type of fishing. But we don't have a whole lot of bone fish. In fact, though, uh, a fellow uh, in one of the beaches that I fish, he called me up one time. He says, I was walking the beach just like you said to do. And I saw some fish, just like you said, and they were right where you said they were. And I cast out, and I hooked one, and it took off, and I knew it wasn't a save. It was a 26-inch bonefish. So you never know. Uh, but that's my favorite type of fishing. I love to go to the Bahamas. I love to go to the Keys. Uh, one of the best places I've ever been bone fishing was Grand Cayman, which is not a bonefish destination per se. But there are a lot of bonefish there, and they're, they can be pretty big. But I can't, like I said, I can't usually bonefish uh, uh, where I live and this is this is the, the second best thing and if you go out on the beach the water's clear the water's beautiful and if you close your eyes you can convince yourself you're walking a Bahamian island and you can convince yourself that all those snook are bonefish and you can have a really good time thanks Steve appreciate it great okay. great